Hello everybody, Jan Rutherford here with uh, Self-Reliant Leadership. Good morning, I've got a very special guest that I'd, I'd like to introduce today and, and um, it comes by way of my good friend Andrew Parrish over in uh, Dublin, Ireland. And he's introduced me um, to Vice Admiral Mark Mellet, the current Chief of Staff of Ireland's Defense Forces. And for those of you unfamiliar with Ireland's Defense Forces and, and that rank, um, Mark Mellet is the highest ranking person in Ireland and he's been in the service for um, uh, a number of decades. And uh, let me bring him on onto the, onto the program and, and uh, Admiral Mellet, welcome. John, great to be with you and all your watchers and uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, Andrew is a great friend of mine, a real innovator. We've known each other now for um, over a decade and um, done a lot of stuff. Well, I, I'm, it, it's a, really an honor to have you on the show. And, and right before we went on, we were talking about um, a mutual friend, um, somebody that I've had the privilege of interviewing a couple of well, times. Was, yeah, your interview with Marty Dempsey. And uh, probably the last time I met Marty was around here with my predecessor, Connor Boyle. And uh, Marty is such a gentleman, um, really proud of his Irish blood um, and has had a remarkable career and continues to give a, a remarkable advice on leadership. Yeah, and um, in th this photo that we've got, um, you're in it with with uh, General Dempsey. When was this taken? That was about 2012, 2013. It was actually the Navy Notre Dame game, and I'm, I'm uh. quite sad because actually one week ago, or almost maybe ten days ago, we would have the next Navy Notre Dame match at the end of uh, August in Aviva Stadium here in Dublin, and of, unfortunately, COVID knocked it out. So I had been doing a lot of work with uh, Notre Dame and with Annapolis to get this match uh, up and running. And, uh, you know, it's one of the kind of um, the prices of the COVID pandemic. But please, God, we'll, we'll move on and we'll get an opportunity to get together again at a future point. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in, in the photo that I've got here, you can see if I point right. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell what that's a map oh, yeah. of. <laughs> I do, yes. Yeah, yeah, very good. That's where uh, no, no snakes. Yes, no snakes in Ireland because St. Patrick banished them on the top of Crow Patrick. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and speaking of Crow Patrick, um, you're from County Mayo, Castlebar. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I've climbed Crow Patrick many times. And it's um, it's just a beautiful climb. There's a lovely church on, on top, and you get a real right. opportunity to reflect and look out over the beauty of Clue Bay out towards uh, Clear Island where Grania Whale. Uh, the Pirate Queen is so famous, and uh, she was a remarkable uh, woman leader uh, back over 400 years ago. Wow. And, and um, yeah, I've climbed it once, and um, I thought it was going to be a piece of cake because I'm used to climbing mountains in Colorado, and it was not an easy climb by any stretch, and, and coming down was pretty slippery. And it, it didn't yeah. look like... Um, Go ahead. It's good up to the up to the shoulder. There's a there's a kind of it, but it turns into quite a steep climb then with a lot of shale. And you every year there are some injuries on it, so it's not one for the lighthearted. No, no. Well, it's it's slick and slippery, and it doesn't look like there's been any improvements in a thousand years. And when I was coming down, everybody kept asking, "Where's your stick? Where's your yeah. stick?" You know, like, "What are you mad?" And um, I said, I can't take a stick on a plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you should have been able to hire one for about a dollar or a euro at the base. They're normally the yeah. And if you give it I back. Should, it <laughs> I, I should have. I should have. So so my grandmother's from Moore Hall, which is just south of Castlebar. So That's we're. Beautiful. Oh, it's beside Loch Cara. Whereas as a youngster, we used to go fishing uh, brown trout on Loch Cara. And they're just the most, the most beautiful trout because. Unlike normal brown trout, which are actually brown, these are silver, almost like a sea trout. And they're just wow. a beautiful, beautiful fish. My grandfather used to fish there. My father used to fish there. I used to fish there as a youngster. And I'd love to be back there now. Uh, yeah. In May for the mayfly. You can dap with the mayfly, which is a, a really unique and an old way of fishing. But, yeah. Uh, well, the, if, you're, if you're headed south to, to Moore Hall, the last cottage, the last houses before you get to Moore Hall, that's the Murphys. That's my family, Whoa. and they're still there. Jeez. So, uh, so we're probably we're probably related somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mayo is quite a small county, you know. So, um, somewhere along the line, there is a linkage. Yeah, and and um, and our and our and our friend um, Marty Dempsey's from uh, from 
he, he hails from Castlebar and and yeah, Johnny Mayo, he, part of Castlebar, and there's a connection in Johnny Gall, I think, as well. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I, I had a, a few things I wanted to to ask you about a little bit of on self, a little bit on others, and or but one of the things I wanted to start out with that might get people's attention a little bit is um, the dreaded word politics. Um, you know, here in the United States, um, you know, it used to be, you know, hey, you just didn't talk about religion and politics and it's even permeated, you know, the military. And I, I can't imagine it's a lot different there. You know, as, as a, a professional, uh, a man of the, in the profession of arms, how do you, how do you deal with that these days um, in managing a lot of young people that have strong opinions and all those items come up? I mean, as a leader, how, how do you how do you manage through that and and walk you know walk the fine line and and stay out of trouble? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 an art. It's not a science, and uh, it's not easy. Um, but I'm, I I always go back to Klausowitz, and he 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 has a very good mm. point of view, which says there can be no other way except to subordinate the military to the political. That's the fundamental of democracy. So there's a clear delineation between the military and the political, and they're, they're like oil and water. They cannot mm. mix. But that being said, you know, you have to deal with it from a few points of view. First of all, you have to understand politics, and you have because that's the, the realm in which policy is formulated. And out of, out of that policy comes your objectives, and you're in the mm -hmm. business of developing a strategy. And if you can't, have a policy strategy match, you've got a problem. So mm -hmm. you, you have to inform, you know, the political in terms of what's in the art to the possible. And and sometimes objectives or policy will be set that is challenging and you have to uh, develop a strategy. And if you can't, you have to package your advice in a, in a language that's understood by the political. The other piece, I suppose, that is quite challenging is sometimes your subordinates are, are those who are interested in your business don't understand why you're not more militant, perhaps, if, if it's a mm. case, case of looking for um, resourcing or uh, with regards to, um, you know, deployments or whatever. And, and you know, if, if, you know, loads of people have a view on what you should do, often mm -hmm. without the accountability or the responsibility or the mandate. And um, that's a difficulty with being a chief because they, they will all tell yeah. you what you should do. But... Right. Um, there's a there's a very good um, uh, Dominic uh, Ortega. He was a, a he was a, actually a farmhand in Spain, and Dominic mm -hmm. was a farmhand who every Saturday went and sold garlic at a, a, a local market. And uh, one day he went to the local market, and the bullfighter didn't turn up at the bull ring, and Dominic climbed in, and he fought the bull, and mm -hmm. the years that follows. Um, he became quite a famous bullfighter until a certain uh, writer, Ernest Hemingway, had a <laughs> reflection. And Ernest Hemingway knew a lot about bullfighting, but he criticized uh, Ortega as not being really from the true blue blood of the bullfighters. And uh, this hurt Ortega to some degree, but he responded in a very good manner, which was using the pen. And he said, the bullfight critics gather in rows in the enormous plaza full. But there's only one man who knows, and he's the man who fights the bull. And that's <laughs> what a chief is. He's a bullfighter. Mm. And while all those who are sitting in the, in the plaza full have a view, at the end yeah. of the day, there's only the bullfighter and the bull. And you have to actually operate in that space until the fight is over. So yeah. it's, it's a, But the critical piece, going back to politics, it's another profession. Uh, you're subordinate to it in a democracy and you need to know that delineation very well. And that's the fundamental of a democracy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really, I mean, having, I mean, really understanding what your values are and, and, and having the discipline to adhere to those um, is, is what I'm hearing you say. When Absolutely. You, and that's an area, you, you know, I think which is critical for a military is, is actually having your values codified, having your values mm. in action, looking for your values champions. And that's what we spend a lot in our own military doing because it, the values are the cement that join the team and actually give you that cohesion in institutions. And our values go back to the foundation of Oak Ignaheran, which is over a hundred years old. And they're there about moral courage mm. and physical courage, 
respect, integrity, loyalty, and selflessness. And we put mm. a lot of effort into having those values in action. We have an award system for our value champions. In fact, uh, later on this year, I hope that we will make those awards. Last year, the President of Ireland gave those awards to our individual values champions within the Defence Forces. And it's a, it's a matter of trying to infect others with those right. values. Yeah. And, and my understanding is it, it, it takes some doing to, to join the, the military in Ireland. I mean, it's pretty competitive and selective. Is that correct? It is. It is competitive. We've been going through a challenge in time in terms of a lot of debate with regards to remuneration. And, and but that matter is moving well. And the government in its current program has decided to have a commission on the defence forces. And we're currently looking at that and uh, under the leadership of our minister. And, and then at the end of that, the government is committed to an independent mechanism for pay determination. And I think that's a great uh, point to land, because mm. the one thing about a soldier, he's different to many other parts of society. First of all, you don't have a union. You're subject to military law. You will never withdraw your labor and um, you're subject to an unlimited liability in that mm. our business is going into harm's way. And the critical piece for, for a military there can be no ambiguity with regards to the call on the military in a democracy. The government must always be certain that when it mm. puts its, its hand over its shoulder for the arrow of its defence forces, that they're mm. there without fear or favour to respond to the requirements of government and the citizen. And that's a big responsibility in terms of maintaining a force to be available at all times to do that. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, there's a lot of talk these days, particularly in the US about generations about the, the concept of entitlement and a lot of times when we talk about leading oneself we use words like discipline you use that as a value and sacrifice and i'm wondering what you what your thoughts are you know as a senior leader to young people these days about you know entitlement and discipline and sacrifice when it comes to um you know serving the greater good yeah, it, it's it's interesting, and I mean, you know, I, I suppose the one of the biggest rewards anybody can get is to give. Mm. It's actually the act of giving, and in our own organisation, those who serve, I actually think they get a reward from service to the state. Now, there's a matter of of a, a loyalty to the state, and there's a matter of a reciprocity for that loyalty. But I, I, I am convinced that actually being a servant of a state is one of the most noblest uh, professions. Mm. I, I, I always make the point that our defence forces are a key component of our security architecture. But more than that, we're actually part of the bedrock on which the sovereignty of the state stands. We're part of the mm. framework that provides for the institutions of a civilised society. And, and a civil society is, is where people are free where the institutions of state function and where the vulnerable are protected. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens mm -hmm. because institutions like ourselves in the military or our police forces make a sacrifice to provide that framework for the state to function. And um, sovereignty and sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imaginary than real. So it's critically important that you actually have that understanding of the linkage between the sovereignty of the state, the, the ability of a state to determine where it wants to go, and the, the insurance guarantor, that is the defense forces of that state. Yeah. And, and you use the word sovereignty, and, and that's not a, a, a term a lot of Americans hear and use often. Um, your independence, Ireland's independence was gained um, basically um, a little, a little bit more than 100 years ago. So do you think the fact that that's a lot more recent is, it changes your perspective on, on what that means and, and there's more of an appreciation for it and, and how fragile and delicate it can be? Yeah, well, well, I think, you know, 100 years ago, my institution was at war. We, we were mm -hmm. in a war of independence for state and, and that's the legacy and that's the institution that Oakley can hear our defence forces was born out of. So we, we, we have in our DNA, you know, my forebears who are in this institution, they go back to the fight for the independence of that state. But more than that, they also had the bitter taste 
of civil war that followed on mm. from that independence. And that's right. a real um, baptism of fire for any state to come out of civil, for, civil war. It wasn't a prolonged civil war, but you know, from a political point of view, the institutions still stand, you know, not from a military point of view. And um, so I, I think the foundation and the, the furnace in which we were forged is, is important, but it's also remembering, you know, where mm. we have come and then, you know, the move on in terms of recognizing our position as an institution of the state, our subordination to the political of the state and our requirements in terms of the, the, the state and its interests. And, and Ireland has huge interests in terms of uh, its global interests. And most recently, one of the, the great decisions was the decision that Ireland should take a seat on the Security Council with the UN. And that's built on, you know, I suppose, a legacy of an outward looking state that has values, that has actually interest in other actors in other states within the world. But it's also yeah. built out of where we come from, a state that itself was once oppressed, a state itself that had its own famine, mm. a state itself that is haunted by a legacy of immigration and a state mm. itself that actually had a delicate birth 100 years ago and understands many other states in the world where they've come from. And there's an empathy then between our state and many of these states throughout the world. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to when we take mm. up our seats in January of next year for our two year term on the Security Council, that we'll be able to bring to bear some of our views in terms of values, not just from a national perspective, but try and influence and bring those to bear in other areas where my, the, the institutions of civil society may not be as well bedded. Yeah, well, and, and most people might not really understand, you know, the, the requirement for a military in Ireland and thinking it's, it's, it's most like Switzerland, that it's very neutral and, you know, who's going to invade Ireland? And, so I and and I wonder if you could just share, you know, briefly, you know, some of the missions um, that that your forces conduct all around the world, and and how that serves, you know, the state's interest. Yeah, well, I you know, for over sixty years we we've been participating, in particular, in UN missions uh, over our almost seventy thousand individual tours of duty, and some of the most challenging theatres in the world. We've, we've, as a force, stood up to violent extremists. We've freed hostages. We've seen many hundreds die. In fact, in recent years in the Mediterranean, we've directly rescued over 18,000 people out of the water in the Mediterranean. We've, we've actually facilitated the rescue of 23,000 people. And we've seen hundreds of people drown. We've recovered many bodies. It is an extraordinary service that the the women and men of Oki Cahiran have given in all the environments. Right now, we have troops mm. in Mali, where recently there was a, a coup, as you're aware. I, mm -hmm. The reason I'm in, I'm not in my naval uh, blues is because I've just come from a, a, a mission rehearsal exercise with our troops preparing for Syria. In the next week or so, those troops will go into quarantine, which is a UN requirement for two weeks, a COVID-related quarantine, in a training camp before then they deploy out to uh, Syria to Camp Fouar which is uh, just to the east of, or sorry, to the west of Damascus in one of the most challenging theatres in the world. Overall, at the moment, we have about 360 troops nearly, or sorry, 560 troops in 13 missions in, in uh, 14 countries. It's just um, a very large commitment from a very relatively small force, but it's part of our values as a mm -hmm. state. We do that in response to decisions of government, and we do it uh, primarily in partnership with two institutions, um, actually the UN or the EU and uh, we're also involved in Kosovo uh, and, and in the Balkans with NATO so mm -hmm. we're always operating to a UN mandate yeah and, and, and a lot of what you're you know if you're doing comes from a humanitarian perspective and and the other thing I wanted to touch on is in in past lectures you've talked a lot about diversity and inclusion and um, I, I'm wondering um, you know what your your views on that are as as a leader in in trying to to change and 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 make progress in in those areas. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. But I, I suppose about ten years ago, I was involved in a research cluster with um, some universities, University College Cork and Cork Institute of Technology, and a lot of enterprise. And we had this mm -hmm. this um, this hub created, 
and we were looking at innovative ways in which we could make the Navy better. And I remember a young PhD um, a student, a female who was not in the services at all, and, and she made a remark as to why didn't we try something in the way we went about our patrolling? It was, a, it was an analytical approach using dynamic mm -hmm. scheduling. And you'd be much more efficient in terms of where you put your effort. And I remember reflecting, uh, and at that stage, I had 30 years service. And I said, how come I never thought about that before? Mm. And it was just that kind of moment whereby it was the different perspective coming into the group think of the Navy at the time that yeah. opened my eyes. And then I, I put a mirror up to the organization. And at that stage, I think I looked and I saw 94% male, 6% female. And I said, you know, the balance is, is not healthy from the point of view of getting those different perspectives. That was the first piece. But the other piece was then I, I began to look and said, where are all the other communities? And it was then I began to think about the, 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 the different communities there, whether it be culture or whether it be creed or even generation in terms of age, sexual orientation. Where, how do we provide for the diversity within that? And it was in the years that followed then that we became much more, um, I suppose, engaged in creating the environment whereby nobody felt un uncomfortable in the military, mm. that we were really driving diversity and more importantly, inclusion. You know, uh, somebody I think once said, um, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And mm. you know, very often institutions um, will have a diversity and inclusion strategy, but the critical piece is to ensure that it is actually actioned and that you provide for all the different perspectives that exist in society, whereby people can give their totality and not feel in any way they have to mm. conform to be somebody else that they're not naturally. Yes, we yeah. have a disciplinary process and we all sign up for that, but the actual uniqueness of every individual should be allowed to blossom in an organization. And that way you'll get the best in terms of return. And whether it's male or female, whether it's gay or straight, or whether it's um, you know European or Asian, there should be a place in institutions like the military so that we operate with each other knowing that our strength comes from the diversity of perspectives within the organization. And there's a, there's a point beyond that, and I'll just finish it here. It's not just about the internal diversity within an organization. It's also about how your organization mixes externally, because mm. you know, the, the military is not an end in itself. You know, it's, it's part of an orchestra, and whether it be the NGO community, or whether it be investment, whether it be the diplomats or the politics, the, the military is just one, if you like, part. It could be the string section of an orchestra. And so therefore, we need to be able to operate in diverse env environments. Mm. And that's why within our own military, I keep on advocating that we are not just warriors, we're also diplomats. And what I mean yeah. by being a diplomat, we're the ones that actually pull the diverse external actors into the rook mm. to get a common view on, on a matter. And, and the final piece is, and this goes to the way knowledge is exploding, we have to be scholars. So yeah. our soldiers and our mm. sailors, our men and women, have to be warriors, diplomats, and scholars. Yeah. It, it, it strikes me that, um, you know, in the United States, the military is less than 1% of the population. And, and unfortunately, it's become a family business that most of the people in the service have a relative that served and that's sort of the cycle and most are from the South. Um, in Ireland, a country of about 5 million people, you know, it's interesting because you've already talked about innovation hubs and, and different things. Our, my perspective is the military in the United States is sort of a cocoon. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons that when they transition out of the military, they have so much trouble because they have not been integrated into society at all. And it sounds like in Ireland that there's a lot more integration that you're almost counted on to interpret the meaningful outside, you know, the yep. meaningful outside, you know, the, the, the country and the world and, and what that means to the state. Would that be yep. correct? No, you're absolutely correct. I mean, we can look at all the challenges in the world as they, they currently stand, and there, and there are many. And I think this is about the tenth successive year whereby we have a general decline in terms of peace and security, according to the Global Peace Index. But on the positive side, there's a massive uh, explosion in terms of automation, in terms of robotics, in terms of data, in terms of knowledge. 
And it's, it's moving so fast that no organization can rely on having the answers to its challenging problems within its organizational boundaries. And so I, I have a philosophy that you need to seed power to gain power. Mm. And what I mean by that is it's through your network that increasingly you will find the answers to your challenging problem. So the sophistication of your network from the military in terms of how it engages with higher education institutes, how it engages with other militaries, how it engages with the institutions of civil society, how it engages even with um, other state actors. That's where the actual interplay in that network gives you access to answers to problems that you have within your organization. So if you're continually looking in terms of closed innovation within your organization for answers, the rate of generation of new knowledge is so fast that it's most likely the answer is somewhere else outside your organization. And the trick is to, to have a broad network whereby there's a reciprocity and a communication and a collaboration. And that goes to the heart of our own philosophy, not just in terms of our military, in terms of external engagement, but even our state and the, the adherence to that fundamental, what I think is important principle of multilateralism. You know, niart go curlicela is an Irish phrase. There is no strength without unity. And that goes for states. Yeah. And, and, and that's, even if we look at the, the, um, the security that has been in Europe for nearly 75 years, notwithstanding the wars in the Balkans, but in a general sense, it has come from that cohesion that has been built up with now, you know, 28 going down to 27 states working together in lockstep, not perfect, but actually have that multilateral approach to actually doing things together. And if you look at some of the challenges over the horizon, in particular, biodiversity loss and climate change, there is no way those, those real huge vectors are going to be addressed unless mm -hmm. there's a multilateral framework. And that brings us right back to the institution of the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals. That's the only show, really, that's going to give us that lockstep manner in which we can deal with them. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I think you just described networking the best the best way I've ever heard it described. And, and as you were speaking, I was visualizing, you know, sort of nodes and neural networks and that, you know, somewhere in your office, you've got a whole map of how all this is connect and where the, the weak points are and where things need to be shored up. Um, do you yeah. see it? Do you see that sort of visually? I do. I, I, I do. And it, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's, I don't know if you've ever come across uh, the writer Erka, Erkart Tolle, you know, mm. he, he has written um, The Power of Now and New Earth. It is really worth a read, New Earth in particular. But he spends a lot of time dealing with one three-letter word called ego. And in mm. my experience, one of the biggest impediments to networking, one of the biggest, biggest drivers of silos are egos, who, who actually are more obsessed with their own view of the world than the actual sophisticated actual requirement to actually do it in the context of a multilateral or a network framework. And I go back to my point, you, you, know, you, you gain power actually by seeding power, but that, mm. that means you need to show a vulnerability. You need to put yeah. your hand up and say, I, I need help here. And you'd be willing to actually do the business in terms of getting that support. But it goes back to my opening, very opening mm. point with regards to, you get, I suppose, um, gratitude from given yeah. and it comes back to you in the context of development and i think that's a key point yeah. that eckhart tolle makes in particular in new earth is a whole issue of watch watch the ego yeah it's interesting you say that because i've taken mba students to ireland for years and we put them in startup companies in northern ireland and the republic of ireland and one of the things that every student group says is about culture and the values of Irish companies is they'll walk in and they'll say, <clears throat> the first thing they said to us was, check your ego at the door. Very good. And, and, and right, I mean, because we know, I mean, you nailed it. I mean, you know, pride, pride is a vice and, and, it, and it can be a virtue, but oftentimes, you know, it's a vice. And the executive groups that I tend to work with, most of them are, are not good about raising their hand saying, I need help. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it actually creates a weaker team when everybody says, I got this and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and don't. And, and you said it not only as a team, but, you know, as a diplomat, as a as a state, that there's ways that you need to reach out. And a lot of the problems now are so big, they can't be solved by a, a single entity. 
And I, I think you know, it, it is one of the most powerful things to be able to do, to create that environment where somebody feels comfortable in saying, I'm not comfortable with this, or I have a concern. And we used to have in our gunnery practices years ago, you know, a line that said, nobody will be ever wrong for calling an event that they feel is not right. And, and the, 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 I suppose the drive that with my team now we're trying to move towards is the institutionalizing of a just culture, a culture whereby mm -hmm. it's inevitable that mistakes happen in complex organization. Yeah. The opportunities in the learning, and the sooner you can get to the point whereby you start harvesting the learning, the better. And, you know, in complex organization, mistakes do happen. But in the main, if the culture is right, people are not setting out to make mistakes. And I, there's a point I have in, in mm -hmm. I suppose, the development of the mindset here. We can have one of two types of a soldier. We can have a directed automaton, or we can have enabled autonomy. And enabled autonomy is where I want to go, whereby we empower people right. to do, you know, and, and, <clears throat> and accept that there's a level of risk. But when you have enabled autonomy, you have to accept that you share the risk, that you're not going to throw the innovator under the bus as soon as something goes wrong. You, because it, right. you, you have enabled autonomy for a week or two, but then all of a sudden people will say, actually, I'm not being supported. And they'll go back into just looking for directions and a left and right and being very rigid. Whereas if you want people to blossom, you have to enable that, but you also have to share the risk with them. And you need to create a culture where people have the opportunity and are empowered to put their hand up and say, yep. I've got a or I need help, or I'm not happy. Yeah, I think you've hit on the key things that build trust on the team. You know, often we say, well, it's vulnerability. That's what builds trust on the team. And to a degree it is. But the other thing that you said is you've got to see power and you've got to yeah. let people make decisions. And that really says to people, oh, I'm trusted. Yes. Um, I'm empowered. I'm responsible, you know, for those outcomes. I, I have to own that if, if, if I make if I mess up, if I make a mistake. So I, I think that's that's well said. Um, Admiral, I, I want to ask you. Um, Another question that might be a that might be a tough question. Um, when we look to the future, I mean, you 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 and I are similar age, and we're at a point where there, there's a little bit more runway behind us and in front of us. <laughs> and you know, a lot of what we're thinking about is our legacy, and and um, we're thinking about proteges and and things like that. What is it that you think we haven't gotten done yet? And what's your counsel? For those people that are, you know, are the ones that have, you know, a good 20, 30 years left in their in their careers. I think, first of all, and it's something that, you know, it's a reflection for me, but. In, in if I look back through my career and I've had really a great career, I've had a tapestry of lives, a tapestry of service. Um, one regret is at times it went so fast that I didn't value the present. I didn't, you know, stop for a moment and listen and take stock mm -hmm. of what's here and the beauty that, are, that is around us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in this rush sometimes in terms of progress, we forget and we don't see actually what we have. And, um, you know, the danger with that, when you don't see what you have and you don't value it the way you should, you can make decisions sometimes that are actually uh, not sustainable. You can be wasteful. Mm -hmm. And the one thing of our generation, you know, to some degree, we're terrorists for the next generation. We have consumed resources at a rate that is absolutely unsustainable. We have set a legacy for the next generation, which is an almost gigantic a burden in terms of as they try to deal with the challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change. And in many ways, and there are various views on this, a lot of what has happened on our watch in this generation is irreversible in the context of the damage done to ecosystems, vulnerable marine, marine ecosystems and flora, fauna. So um, what, what I would say is that, you know, we, we need to actually take stock, you know, and start, I suppose, as, as, as leaders, start looking at 
how we can facilitate and help that slowing down and valuing the present, mm. and while at the same time really looking at how we avoid the externalities. And what I mean by that is the unintended consequences that we don't feel is our responsibility, but actually it is on so much mm. of our actions. And we need to internalize those with a view that we know the total cost of things we do today because the resource is finite. And um, so that's that's the learning over my decades. Mm. And, the point of truth, and I look at evidence around me in terms of I'm a sailor, you know, there is no doubt that the um, the storm track of the North Atlantic has become more ferocious in my life. I've seen that in my decades at sea, I've seen it. I've seen it mm -hmm. in recent events in terms of this island, in terms of weather events. And we see it globally in terms of the Sahel, um, you know, Africa as a continent is bearing a price that actually didn't generate, but it is, you know, probably the most impacted continent in terms of climate change. And then we see it in other continents in terms of the Arctic and, and Antarctic in terms of the ice caps. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting to me, um, in the United States, you wouldn't often hear a, a military person really speak as an environmentalist as you are. And, and again, as a, as a seaman, as a sailor, you're somebody that's seen it. And, um, you know, the other comment you made about slowing down, it's interesting in the expeditions I lead with executives and military veterans, the takeaway is always, we need to slow down to speed up, you yeah. know, to, to take time. Well, and I, I say that Jan, because, because I see climate change as probably the greatest threat to security. And so we're back in my business now. Mm, yeah. so climate change is a greater threat to human security. And the other one, which we kind of alluded to, you know, briefly was gender gap. There is an inextricable link between gender gap and interstate and intrastate violence. It is extraordinary, the correlation. So mm. there are two areas where we could really act upon is on the climate change, but also women, peace and security. And I'm glad that that's one of the uh, mm. key strands that our ambassador in New York, Geraldine Bernason, is going to lead in the context of the SECO Security Council seat. Yeah, excellent. The, um, as, we're, as we're wrapping up, I, I just wanted to show you a couple comments that have come in. Um, this one's from Lynn Harris, and I, I'm not sure if you covered that, but um, maybe we could address that for her. How does ego play a part of military decision making in your experience? Yeah, I, I think ego drives the creation of silos and silos undermine trust, efficiency and effectiveness. Often mm. when you're trying to bring two um, you know, disparate groupings together, th th what you find is if you don't get it right in terms of the top, you know, there's a preciousness and a protectiveness of the culture and the the enterprise that's in a, a silo. It's the ego that you have to actually deal with to actually say, go back to seeding mm. power, to gain power. It's the ego you have to deal with to actually say, you know, you can retain your cultural identity. You can retain your competence, but actually you get a force multiplying effect when you bring the two together, where the outcome is actually greater than the sum of the mm. parts. So, mm. but you need to always watch the ego because that's the impediment to bring in those um, groupings together. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting you say that. We um, interviewed a woman uh, recently who led an expedition in Antarctica for a year with 120 people, mostly men. And of all the problems that she encountered, you know, the bacon wasn't cooked right. And, you know, somebody had a problem with somebody. The, the basis of all the problems was somebody felt disrespected. I mean, you know, ego. Ego, ego got in the way. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, I wanted to show you another comment that came in, just um, sort of, a, you know, the damage to the ecosystem is tragic as well as poor leaders who deny science and facts. So thank you. Um, and Lynn, Lynn said, thank you. Um, great point about the effect on, on culture. Um, it, it's been such a, a pleasure and an honor speaking with you. I, I, um, I only wish um, I had a panel of people that could ask you know, even more extraordinary questions. Um, and I re what really resonated with me was not just the, um, you know, the warrior part of the military, but um, how seriously you take the diplomacy part and the fact that you're advocating for, for scholarship and, you know, to be well informed. It is, you know, before we go, Admiral, I wonder if uh, 
if you could, if there's anything else you'd like to offer, especially for young people that are listening and taking on leadership roles, after all, you are a Mayo man from Castlebar. I, I know you've got, you, you can tell a, a good story. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just, I suppose at the end of the day, I, I have to say how proud I am of the women and men in our defense forces, in, in the army, in the Navy, in our air force. And, um, you know, we do put a huge amount into developing them. There's a re remarkable career for everybody. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, our, our junior leaders are developed to a level six. Our senior leaders do, and, and our junior non-commissioned leaders to a degree level. Uh, and we, we really see that our institution and its linkage with regards to the sovereignty of the state is, is fundamental to the security of the state. Uh, and um, I, I hope that we can continue on getting great men and women to join our organization. And it's just great being talking to you this morning, John. Uh, it's, it, it really is, is, is my honor. And, um, you know, thank you for um, all those years of service. And, um, and I have to, I have to um, wave, wave the tricolor for you. Um, and, and I hope we're back um, in Ireland in 22, 2022 and, and um, we're able to meet you in, in, in person. And, um, you know, and, and again, if you're ever um, on this side of the pond, we, we, uh, we'd love to, to host you. John, listen, thanks very much. And I've really enjoyed the chat and I've really enjoyed some of your other interviews. I always get learning from them. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.